Okay, so I'm gonna show you and remind you how to um, do a chicken. So you cut the, the skin here, put your finger in, and you actually take the joint out, so it goes like that, and then you cut round. To do the chicken, let's do this side as well. Okay. With the chicken uh, breast, which is what we want for the uh, nuggets and the schnitzel, we are going to cut, so the backbone is here, as you can hear. So don't cut right in the middle, cut slightly to the side, put the knife in, slide all the way down, and that opens this up. Now with this first sixth quarter of the knife, if I get my hand out of the way, you just make gentle sliding motions and you just take the meat off the bone. Turn it around if that's easier. Okay, so we ignore that just for the moment as we're not going to actually use that. So one chicken breast, as you see, it's far bigger than you ever buy in the shops. On the back here, you have what's called the fillet or the supreme, and actually we can use that as as a nugget. All right. So what we're going to do now then, remember this is waste not want not. So what we can do is we're going to use one chicken breast and make two dishes because you only have to present two plates of food. So what we're gonna do is, to make the schnitzel, I'm gonna cut this in half this way. I'm gonna put the knife in and gently saw, just like that. So I've got a nice kind of even, fairly even chicken steak. So that's for the schnitzel, we'll be back that out later. What I now need to do is make this into chicken nuggets or chicken tenders or whatever you fancy really. So because that's the natural shape of the tender, we're just gonna cut that into a similar shape. So there now we have the child's chicken. Here we have the adult's chicken, but it's from one chicken breast. What we're now going to do, let me just take these off, is, and I will actually just take off this chicken breast very quickly, although I'm not going to use it, but we can use it another time. We're now, we're now going to make a, um, a brown chicken stock. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut this in half with a knife on a baking tray and we're going to roast that for about 20 minutes until it's all nice and roasted and then we're going to make a stock with it. So to prepare the schnitzel, schnitzel is German or Austrian, and when it is, it's a battered out piece of meat uh, that's breadcrumbed. Um, it's traditionally veal, which is young cow, but essentially anything, any meat that's been uh, flattened out and covered in breadcrumbs can be called a schnitzel. We put some cling film over the top. What we now do is with a rolling pin, we gently tap, keyword gentle, if you knock it like mad, um, you'll break the chicken, the chicken will kind of split. So you, all you're trying to do is even out the thickness. That's all you're doing and try to make it a slightly wider. So it becomes more like a chicken steak, I guess. So. Notice I'm just doing it on this top bit rather than down here because this is thin already. Right, the fat bit was on the top. Okay, and that's it. So. And then, because it's the same thickness, that would ensure that it would cook at the same speed. Um, I've already cut the chicken nuggets, so there we have the, uh, the children's um, chicken nuggets. And what we're going to do in a second is we're going to breadcrumb them, which is otherwise called panayin. Okay, so we've done the chicken, and we're going to breadcrumb that in a second. What we do first, though, and as I've mentioned about the time plan, um, in the specification, that's 2.4. The exam board put and the marking puts a lot of emphasis on the time plan and it's really important it's done right. Uh, the exam board do look for um, dovetailing of tasks. So for example, if making two dishes, you don't make one dish first and then do that completely and then you do the second dish, you do both at the same time. And this is why this is important. So because we are preparing two at the same time. All right, and this is kind of why it works. So what we're gonna do first of all is season. So a little bit of pepper. A little bit of salt. You could, of course, not put salt on the children's wine and say that in the coursework, right? Because you can say, you know, positive um, health, not putting salt on. 
When we flour any breadcrumb, which is also called pan it is a good idea, unless you have lots of plates, is put them in sandwich bags, all right? So we've got some flour, some egg, and some breadcrumbs. Can't remember the order. Think of February, F-E-B, flour, egg, and breadcrumbs. So all we're gonna do is, let's just do the schnitzel first. You yeah, just get the chicken out of the way. So you put the chicken schnitzel in a bag of flour, take it out. Put it into the egg, this will be the slightly messy bit. All right, we'll take it out anyway, give it a little wiggle around. What we then do is transfer that straight into the bag of breadcrumbs. By the way, with the breadcrumbs, you could actually make some bread and then, and then put it in the food processor to crumb it. That would be a massive tip for the skills as well, if you, if you were able to do that. But of course it's time and how long you've got to actually do it. But if you could do that, that would be a very big tick rather than buying pre-done uh, bread. So there we go, there is our schnitzel all done and we're just gonna do the goujons in uh, exactly the same way. Okay, so the chicken's done. Uh, we're now going to make the chicken stock that's gonna be for the risotto for the schnitzel. Just worth pointing out about it being tidy all the way through in your time plan, I would strongly suggest every 20 minutes, 25 minutes, you just put maybe two, three minutes as a section to say clear up. All right, because that will then show the examiner that you are tidy all the way through. When your teacher's marking your practical, they have a sheet and uh, 3.5 on that sheet actually says about safety, um, showing safety principles or practices even. Um, and if you are messy, your teacher's really gonna struggle to be able to give you the highest mark. And again, that will have an impact on not just the practical mark, but on your coursework mark as well, on the NEA mark, right? Everything's tied in. So to make the stock, I see, so we've browned the chicken that's been in the, uh, been in the oven about 20 minutes now. All we're gonna do is we're literally gonna chop up one carrot. You haven't got to peel it or take the ends off. It's literally for flavor. There's no way to chop it. You chop it in half, in quarters, it doesn't matter at all. It's just for flavor that goes in the pot. With the onion, and this always scares people a little bit, just take the top off, cut it in half, just like you would normally. Now, one half, we're gonna use that later to make the risotto. But the other half, we're literally just gonna chop up with the skin on and the root on and put that in there as well. Okay, now remember, this is called waste not, want not. So this half we're gonna use for the risotto, as it's only one portion. The other half can be to make the stock. And all that happens now is we top it up with cold water. We again give the water a season. So just enough cold water just to cover, you know, more or less all the chicken. Um, we're then going to season um, with salt and with pepper. Um, again, really important, season all the way through. Salt and pepper. Now that's gonna go on. You need to simmer this for about 20 minutes. Now, if I didn't say this, this is called a brown chicken stock because the chicken is brown before it goes in. You can use a white chicken stock, which is literally the raw chicken carcass that goes in, but you get a far superior flavor using a brown chicken stock. All right, so the stock's now gonna go um, onto the heat. So without the stage, so the chicken's been done and breadcrumbed. Uh, the chicken now is in the fridge. All right, let's think about safety and hygiene and what, and what have you. The chicken stock is on. We've just chopped up the onion for ready for the risotto, so the other half of the onion. What we can now do is actually start thinking about making the chips. Now, traditionally, obviously chips would be uh, deep fried. On the, um, on the actual spec, on the brief, it's, it mentions the words healthy um, and nutritious. Now, you can't really call any deep frying healthy or nutritious. So you're gonna ask Bethany, who's in here as well. Bethany, how can we make the chips? Oven we could oven bake them. Okay, so the best way to do um, chips, if I show you the, the technique first, is to square them off. So what you can do is take one end off, take the other end off, and you literally stand it on its, um, on its end. Keep the skin on, just because um, all the fiber of any vegetable is just under the skin. And they say this in the coursework as well. You peel the potato, you lose all the fiber. All you're gonna do is, I'd go chunky, but it's up to you, but keep it consistent. So, all you're gonna do is slide, go down, go down, go down. Maybe just lose the end bit. And then what you will then want to do is cut it into chips. I'd go fairly chunky, like I said. Think at this point, you need to have a really good idea about presentation. 
Okay, so you, if, are you putting it in a chip basket? Are they going on the side? Are you gonna stack them, sort of like Jenga, like that? And that, that could determine the size of the chip. What we're now gonna do is get a saucepan, we're gonna put these in a saucepan, cover them with water, and we're gonna boil that for two minutes, literally 120 seconds. At that point, we take them out, we drain them, we put them on a baking tray, drizzle them with oil, season them, and then put them in the oven for until they're done. It's gonna be 15 minutes or so until they're done. You'll see a picture of them done on a baking tray in a second. Okay, so everything's ready. We're now gonna put it into the oven. Um, so what we're gonna do is the schnitzel and the um, goujons should be um, done around the same time. So we're gonna put them on a baking tray and Again, link back to the brief, right? So we could fry these in butter and oil, we could deep fry these, we could deep fry the chips, but it mentions healthy and nutritious. So always linking it back to the brief. So what we're gonna do now then, is we're gonna sprinkle over some oil, not too much, otherwise you'll, you might as well fry it. Bit of oil. And then we've also got the chips, which we have parboiled for a few minutes, right? So just taking the raw edge off. This will take around 15, 16, 17, in between 15 and 20 minutes to bake. When these go in the oven, we're then gonna make the risotto. It will then come out at the same time and then we can plate up, right? And this is where the dovetailing of the uh, time plan is really important because you need to be seen to bring everything together at the same time. So chicken's in the oven. We're now gonna make the risotto. So risotto is extremely versatile. There are probably hundreds of um, risotto recipes. We can do a very plain risotto. Um, to go with the chicken schnitzel. What I've done with it, half of the onion we've already chopped, I've put that in some oil, and we're gonna very gently fry it. Now you don't want any color on there, otherwise you'll have like dark brown bits in the risotto and it just spoils the appearance. Once it's softened slightly, so that's again the heat regulation, right? So I'm using um, electric, um, but use gas, just turn it down if you need to. We're gonna use proper risotto rice, and see that. So the grains are kind of short and, short and fat basically it's different to regular rice. For one person, it's about a handful, a decent handful, we'll put that in. What we then do is we actually fry the rice for about 10 seconds. And what happens there is we actually do start to cook the rice a little bit. There's no liquid in there yet, there will be. Um, but this part is important. So just allow that fry for a second. What you'll notice here then is I have the, um, the chicken stock and a ladle. Now what the process of risotto is, is that you put one ladle in at, in at a time and you stir constantly the risotto. When that's absorbed, the liquid is absorbed in, you then put the second ladle of, um, of risotto in and that will mean that you have a creamy risotto. So, let's put one ladle full of your homemade chicken stock. And I was saying to uh, my students in the room at the moment, so Bethany and Holly, is that you could, of course, use a chicken stock cube. Of course, you could, but because you've made this, it's a massive tick on the on on for, for the practical exam. All right, a massive tick because you made your own stock. So I put that in first. It's bubbling immediately, but you must stir it straight away. And what will happen all, all the time? That will absorb into the rice. Once it gets obviously quite thick, you then put the next ladle in, then the next ladle, and you keep adding stock until the rice is cooked. Now that would take about 15 minutes. Okay, so therefore you want a very gentle simmer. Mine's actually simmering or boiling a bit too much at the moment. You want a gentle simmer, otherwise all the liquid will evaporate before the rice has a chance um, to cook. Okay, so that's the risotto. So this is just after the first ladle floor. And you see lots of the liquid has now evaporated, but you still see the rice is very white and therefore not yet cooked. So we, as I said, simply carry on as a ladle for the homemade stock. Just a reminder, if you run out of stock, then use water, that's not a, a problem, because um, you've got the flavour in the stock anyway, okay? Just so that is clear. So my time has gone off for the schnitzel and the uh, goujons or the nuggets. I would, if at all possible, and if you have one, is to use one of these. Again, this will take a, food, a, a, a box on the food safety bit when you're actually cooking. So when you put it in, we're looking for over 75 and the middle it shoots up to 94. If you're using a probe, make sure it doesn't touch the baking sheet or you're measuring the baking sheet and not the food. But we therefore know that this is definitely done. Okay, and that is very important. And in the time plan, you could say, 
I'm testing my food with a, a thermite food thermometer to check that the middle of the meat is over 75 plus. So my risotto is nearly done, to show you that in a second, and then we're gonna put the dish together. So the risotto's done. I know the risotto's done, because you can see it's kind of, it's kind of wet, but creamy wet. Um, I taste one of the little bits of rice, and it's what the Italians call al dente, which is to the bite. It's not completely mushy, there is a little bit of bite in there. What you now need to do, which is actually really important for the final dish, you put some Parmesan in. You can get different qualities of Parmesan, um, Reggiano and all kinds of different salts, but as long as it's Parmesan of some sort. So a little bit of cheese in there. And what this will do, this will give it a nice creamy finish and actually make all the difference to the flavor. Now, if you notice, that's just one portion, which is actually perfect for what we want. Okay, let's plate it up. So actually on the specification on AC 3.4, it says complete dishes using presentation techniques. And for the highest grade, which is a distinction in that bit, it says presented independently using a range of techniques. Okay, it needs to look good. Therefore, the plate you put it on is vitally important. I would keep away from a regular white plate if I were you, just because they're okay, but things we use in the school canteen. There are much nicer plates, but do really think about the presentation before you actually cook what you're making. Is it, will it look good in a round bowl? Would it look good in a, on, a, on a long plate? Would it look good on a slate, which is quite trendy? Just be, remember what this is for. This is for a bistro. Um, this is not kind of fine dining. It's a bistro that you take your family. Okay, so kind of have that in mind as well when you choose uh, the dishes. But also think, would you give the same dish, to, if we're doing the adults and children, would you give the same size plate or the same looking plate to an adult and a child? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. So it does look a little bit different, but keep that in mind. So if you look at this, it looks very one dimensional. I mean, it's all done and it has all the, all the skills in there, but it's a long plate, there's nothing going on. You do need some green on here. I haven't got any green, um, but if this was you kind of on the day, I would then consider to replate it. Because if you look at it, it just looks, looks beige. It looks all a bit spread out and food does need a little bit of layering, a little bit of height. So I'm gonna replate it and see if it looks any better after I replate it. So I put it now on a round bowl and as you see it's got a little bit of height. If I had some green, a bit of salad, a bit of watercress, that would look great kind of in the corner. What I've also made is, um, it's literally Parmesan cheese because it kind of goes with the theme of the risotto. Put it in a baking tray, three minutes maybe until it melts and it browns and then it will harden to a crisp, okay? And then that can be put on the top as a decoration. As you'll see. Okay, so this is the children's one. Um, as you can see, I put it in a basket. Does it add to the flavor? Absolutely not, but it adds to the appearance. I could stack them. Nuggets are done and we've got some mayonnaise in the middle. Now if you use mayonnaise, I strongly suggest you make the mayonnaise. That's another tick. You could use ketchup, but again, make the ketchup or barbecue sauce, make the barbecue sauce, right? It really matters that you make everything that you can. And there we go. So I waste not, want not, two fairly easy dishes using one basic ingredient and a couple of variations.